Welcome back to the playlist on heme biosynthesis. In the last video, we looked at the reaction of delta amino linoleic acid synthase, and that's what this molecule is right here. This molecule, we abbreviated ALA, but this right here is delta amino linoleic acid. Okay, and we synthesized that inside the mitochondria, and now what we're going to do is we're going to transport the delta amino linoleic acid out into the cytosol of the cell that's making heme, and then we're going to condense two molecules of delta amino linoleic acid into one molecule of this guy, which is called porphobilinogen. So this is porpho porphobilinogen, and porphobilinogen is extremely important in all, or, all organisms that are making molecules like this because it turns out that not only is heme, by the way, that's heme O, A, B, and C types, not only are all those made from porphobilinogen, but also things like vitamin B12, um, things like siroheme, there's all sorts of molecules that ultimately come from porphobilinogen. Okay, so this is an extremely important molecule to make. And the enzyme that's going to transform two delta amino linoleic acids into porphobilinogen is called porphobilinogen synthase. Another name that you might hear this enzyme referred to as is delta amino linoleic acid dehydratase. And the reason that the enzyme gets this name is because part of the mechanism involves a dehydration of delta amino linoleic acid synthase. Okay? So without boring you any further about this reaction, let's talk about the enzyme a little bit. Um, it turns out that this enzyme is pretty strongly inhibited by lead, which is part of the mechanism of lead toxicity. The actual regulation and inhibition and activation of this enzyme we're going to talk about in a completely separate video, mainly because this particular enzyme uses a very special type of allosteric regulation called morphine allosteric regulation. So that's going to be a topic of a completely separate video. But also what you can have is a deficiency of this enzyme. And a deficiency of this enzyme is called amino linoleic acid dehydratase deficiency porphyria. Okay, so this is one of the porphyrias that you can have, which is basically a deficiency of any of the enzymes involved in heme biosynthesis. Another name that you might hear this enzyme referred to as, the more common name, is DOS porphyria. So this is DOS porphyria. And this particular porphyria is basically an autosomal recessive porphyria, meaning that let's say you have a heterozygous individual for this particular porphyria. If you have a heterozygous individual for this porphyria, that means they're going to have this, if you, if you represent the allele as A, capital A, little a. The same thing goes for, say, uh, the mother if this person does not experience DOS porphyria, okay? So when you do the Punnett square to figure out what the possible uh, genotypes are for the children, you would basically find that one of them is going to be homozygous dominant, meaning they won't express DOS porphyria. Two of them are going to be heterozygous for DOS porphyria, meaning they'll carry the gene for it, uh, but they will not express the, the disease. And then one of them, one-fourth of the individuals who will be born from these parents are going to express the DOS porphyria. And this is what we term homozygous recessive. And this is, goes with all the other porphyrias. You end up getting um, accumulation of amino levulinate. It's a nasty thing. You get um, serious skin conditions, like you can't be exposed in the sun for a period of time. You get blistering, scarring, all sorts of stuff like that. And you get things like nausea, vomiting, constipation, and all sorts of nasty things that you don't want. Okay, And that's what we call a deficiency of delta amino linoleic acid dehydratase or porphobilinogen synthase. It's called amino linoleic acid dehydratase deficiency porphyria or DOS porphyria. Okay, and in the next video, we're going to go over the regulation of this enzyme because it turns out that this is an important control point in the synthesis of heme and in other organisms, the synthesis of heme, B12, and siroheme. 
Okay, so you have to regulate this enzyme before it gets um, too far into the pathway, and we'll go over the regulation in another video. But now what I want to do is focus on the organic and partially inorganic mechanism of this enzyme. Okay, because in all these videos we're going to be doing the mechanisms. Okay, now what I want to point your attention to in the active site is there's a critical zinc 2 plus here in the active site. And at the beginning of the proposed mechanism, you start out with this hydroxide that's sort of chelated here um, in the active site next to the zinc. And it turns out that this hydroxide and what will soon be water is going to be an important bronsted lowry acid slash base that's in the active site. Okay. And it turns out that the very first step of this mechanism is the hydroxide is actually going to deprotonate a fully protonated lysine that exists in the active site. Number one, generating water that's now uh, electrostatically interacting with the zinc, but also now you have a, a deprotonated lysine that can now serve as a nucleophile. And that's in fact what's going to happen. This lysine is going to nucleophilically attack this carbonyl of delta amino levulinic acid. And that's going to generate a tetrahedral intermediate as shown right here. Okay, this is the tetrahedral intermediate. Then what's going to happen is this, this oxyanion right here is going to deprotonate this lysine right here. And that's going to generate deprotonated lysine and get rid of that, um, that positive charge on the lysine. Okay. And in the very next step, what we're going to do is we're going to form a shift base. So this lone pair on the lysine is going to kick in here, and that's going to form the shift base. And you have to have a leaving group. And so what's going to happen is this hydroxide is going to come in here, and it's going to now attack the zinc, and that's going to force this particular water molecule to leave. Okay. Yeah. So now effectively what you have is you have this shift base lysine attached to this delta amino levulinic acid that's in the active site. Okay? And now you have another lysine residue, which I've denoted as lysine A. This one up here was lysine B. And the same mechanism basically is going to happen again. You have a hydroxide now that's chelated here to the zinc. This hydroxide is going to deprotonate lysine A in the active site, generating deprotonated lysine. And the same thing basically is going to happen again. This lysine is going to nucleophilically attack the carbonyl of delta amino levulinic acid, the second one that is, and it generates a tetrahedral intermediate. Now what's going to happen is this oxyanion that's part of the tetrahedral intermediate will now, of course, deprotonate the lysine Okay, getting rid of the positive charge and the negative charge. And then after that, we're going to get another shift base formation. So this lone pair is going to kick in here to form the shift base. And that's effectively going to kick off this hydroxide. And when it does, it attacks the zinc. And once again, you get loss of water. So in this step, basically, you should see loss of this H2O. And that H2O is this one right here. So now we should have a zinc that is chelated by this hydroxide here in the active site. Okay, so now what's going to happen is this hydroxide that's chelated to the zinc is now going to do a proton transfer right here. So remember that shift bases can act as an electron sink. Okay, so that means that these pi electrons right here that I'm going to highlight in yellow, these pi electrons right here can kick onto the nitrogen if we attack this carbon right there. And so what's going to happen is this proton transfer is going to ensue. These electrons come in here to form a double bond, and that causes this bond to break. And now the lone pair ends up on the nitrogen. Thus, the nitrogen acts as an electron sink. Okay, now what's going to happen is... We're going to reform the shift base, so this lone pair is going to kick in here to form the shift base. And this, these pi electrons right here are going to come out, basically, and they're going to attack this red carbon right here, getting rid of this shift base and forming a covalent bond between the remains of both of the delta amino levulinic acids. Okay? And both of them are now covalently bound to lysine residues in the active site. Now what's going to happen is this lone pair on the nitrogen is going to come and it's going to nucleophilically attack this carbon right here. And this shift base nitrogen is therefore going to act as an electron sink. So these pi electrons kick up onto a lone pair here on the lysine. 
Okay, and now we've effectively cyclized the two delta amino levulinic acids. Now what's going to happen is this hydroxide right here, this hydroxide is going to do a proton transfer. It's going to abstract this proton right here. That's going to break this bond, and it will basically come in here to form a double bond, and that will expel lysine A as the leaving group. Okay, so now we have a double bond here in what is eventually going to become the pyrrole ring. Okay, so now we have this structure right here. Now what's going to happen is this lysine B here at the top is going to do a proton transfer with water. That's going to, of course, generate a hydroxide that's chelated to the zinc here. And now this lysine is going to be in the protonated state. So now what's going to happen is the hydroxide is now going to do another proton transfer. It will abstract this proton right here from what is going to be the pyrrole ring, causing a double bond to form here and expulsion of lysine B as the leaving group. So now we have this guy right here. The next step of what's going to happen is uh, this lysine right here, lysine B, is going to do another proton transfer, causing a double bond rearrangement, okay, and that forces these pi electrons up onto as a lone pair on this nitrogen and effectively what that does is it creates this porphobilinogen right here. The last step of this mechanism is a proton exchange with lysine A. This lysine A is going to abstract a proton from the water that's chelated here to the zinc and that basically regenerates the zinc um, in an electrostatic interaction with hydroxide. And these right here are our final products. This is porphobilinogen, which will then go and react with porphobilinogen deaminase, another cytosolic enzyme that will generate something called hydroxymethylbilane, which will continue into heme synthesis. And of course, we regenerate our two fully protonated lysine residues in the active site, and of course we get zinc in an electrostatic interaction to hydroxide. And that's the mechanism of porphobilinogen synthase. I hope this video gave you a little bit of intuition on this enzyme. In the next video, we're going to look at the allosteric and other types of regulations of porphobilinogen synthase. See you in the next video.